I will try it then, yeah. Hello. Um, I'd like to say thank you very much for um, inviting me. Uh, so that's, the, that's forward, is it the side? Let me just... That's it. That's Put it there. Yeah. Uh, yeah, it's great to be with so many people, especially architects. I like architects. I'd like to say thank you to the architects that designed my council estate that I grew up on in Leicester. Uh, in the, in the 50s and 60s. Um, they were wonderful. They provided such green space, the gardens, the allotments, where I could really see kindness developing there. And the most important outcome to kindness is what we call companionship and companions, and that is the key to climate change resilience in our understanding. Um, so companionship I want to talk a lot about today. Um, so, um, Mary gave a lot, a big, a fantastic talk about successes. As a scientist and uh, a seeker, for me the most important thing is mistakes and the environment to be allowed to make mistakes. So I've been making mistakes on trees and agroforestry for 60 years. So I'm proud to be able <laughs> to present all my mistakes and try to help, you know, I hope this is helpful. Um, all right. Where, oh, there it is. So that's the talk. Uh, the company is Biodiversity International Limited. That's my company and that's really set up to have as much fun as possible. That's the whole purpose of the company. Um, and we do high quality work in relation to global sustainability in relation to nature-based solutions. So how can we form companionship with nature and learn about nature and what amazing harmonies go on? How can we work together to find that? And the whole lot started from a packet of radish seeds, uh, trying to grow radishes under trees, but now... We're working at the scale of a billion dollars for climate change resilience. So we help architects to win contracts at that scale. So looking at whole nature-based solutions and building on the coast of Bangladesh. These are the appropriate budgets for climate change resilience. The things that we do in the UK are on a too small scale in terms of government thinking. Uh, obviously, we need the small scale to learn lessons, but if the government's going to do appropriate action... The UK, I would say, is at least 30 years out of date in terms of nature-based solutions and appropriate policy. We should look to China, we should look to Bangladesh, India. You know, and again, <coughs> very interesting to look at the audience, not many women in the audience... The key to all our work is women, working with women. They the, form a central part. And the test of our nature-based solutions, one of them is that women feel safe to be in the spaces. And they need to be at the driving seat of development. So that was walnuts and wheat. And it was known 400 years ago, John Eveling says, you know, the, the walnut is, is the mother of the crop, not the problem. So, that, so we need to shade a lot of the crops from too much heat as we move into climate change. Photosynthesis is seriously, in many plants, is reduced by having too much heat. So shade can do this. So we've worked in 90 countries, and that includes work in Bhutan, where we, we work to help them to measure the outcome of companionship through... We worked... We help work with the Commission for Gross National Happiness uh, at an incredible time when it, Bhutan moved from a monarchy to a democracy. Um, so we look at how the trees and working with people can help the animals and how the animals can help the trees. So we also need to improve animals' life on farms as well as it, people. So what are the definitions of these tree-based, nature-based solutions? What can we do and how does this relate to architects? So we've got uh, four different scales. Definitions of agroforestry, we're going to look at forest gardens, food forest, forest village and town. 
So it starts just with a tiny little plot, you know, just one of the planters outside of a police station where you've got one tree and you're allowing the beans to climb up the tree. And the key concept is cropping the vertical dimension. We now have a completely different understanding of plants. Instead of a competitive understanding of plants where they all compete for the same resources, we now have an understanding of what's called niche hyperspace, where they can coexist as companions and be far more productive. So these are not romantic notions. This is at the cutting edge of science, where we can get the maximum number of people per, uh, feed enough, you know, the maximum number of people. So the scales are plot level, village level, landscape level and county level, and in Bangladesh, country level. Shapes, there can be blocks, linear, there can be oases, um, and we're going to try to find exemplars. So when we have companions, we can search together for exemplars, good, good practices. Let's make mistakes together and let's find the best examples. Replicable models have to be bankable. They have to be linked to social enterprises that can actually attract funding to be scaled up dramatically. Um, so we'll look at that. How, how can we have an income you know, from our village forever? How can we endow a landscape function forever? What, what kind of financial model can we develop? What kind of partnership, government and procurement can be done to accelerate the process? Can we supply the prisons and the hospitals? Um, so looking at value change, environmental stewardship, companies or contracts, the notion of carbon negative food, these are all within this presentation. So basically agroforestry is ver vertical farming with trees. It tends to be on agricultural land, so that can be at the periphery of the town or like in Milton Keynes where you've got 5,000 acres running through the town where we do cricket bat willow agroforestry. Uh, trying to find synergy, companionship means synergy between the components, between the trees and the animals and the trees and crops. That's both ways. The animals help the trees, the crops help the trees. We're looking for that together in a, in a group search. Forest gardens more at the garden scale, and the key thing is layering, so we don't just have uh, one layer, we have trees and shrubs, and then we also have the mycorrhizae and different layering below the soil. And we have climbing plants. Food forest is, this is large scale, appropriate to the peri-urban fringe. So we, in our thinking, we don't talk about the green belt, we talk about the green survival jacket. This green survival jacket is the most important spatial consideration for the future. New forest villages, well, we're looking now at funding the whole lot using what we call Howardian economics. So this is an idea developed in the 1890s and it's still relevant today. If there's only one book you should read after this talk, it's Towards Tomorrow by Ebenezer Howard. That, that is absolutely, totally relevant today in terms of funding, green infrastructure and climate change resilience, 1897. Right, so let's give you a practical example now. A lot of that was kind of... So it's not a new idea. This, this idea of three sisters is thousands of years old. This is, we learn a lot in our work from indigenous knowledge. So this, I work with the Popolucan Indians in Mexico and the, the Olmecs, these predate the Mayans and the Aztecs which developed this system. So the three sisters are companions. So we've got the vertical production from the corn, that provides support for the beans, and then the squash stops the weeds and it improves soil fertility. So they're working as companions, just like we like people to be companions. This is how the plants work together. What does this mean? It means you need three times more land area to get the same yield from monoculture. This is what we call the land equivalent ratio, which is a, me a measure of how efficient mixtures are. 
We would need three times more land area to get the same yield from the maize, the beans and the squash. So by combining them together, they don't compete. They fill this hyperspace, this niche hyperspace. Different way of thinking of resources. Not the agrochemical paradigm, which would say, well, they're all feeding from the same beaker and they're competing. That's the wrong paradigm. We've moved on from that in agroecology. But it's not everything's going to do this. So my company provides the services. We work with architects to win contracts for which link buildings to environmental sustainability. You need special knowledge. They're special trees. They're not any old tree to work with any old plant. It's like putting a jigsaw together. You need to know about the pieces. And then they're not any old crops. It's best to have special crops and vegetables. Not all trees work, so a lot of the advice today is not relevant. You know, so forestry advice, advice from land agents may not actually be appropriate. This is a completely different way of thinking. This is a new paradigm. So we're not talking about forestry trees. We're looking at trees in a completely different way. So agroforestry is a nature-based solution. You know, so we use bioengineering a lot. Peri-urban food forests, they're quite big scale. Carbon-negative forest villages. Howardian economics, which try to bring the town and the country together in this three-magnet diagram, and we use a lot of spatial planning ideas to look for the spatial opportunity within a town or a county. So we're doing work for Hampshire County Council at the moment where we're looking at flooding, we're looking at cleaning up the rivers, decontaminating agricultural land. Most of it's contaminated now. Nitrates, phosphates, volatile compounds. We've got Roundup, we've got neonicotinoids. It's a, we need to do decontamination. That is the word for the future. Right, this is, what, this is working at the county scale. An old idea called a structure plan key diagram with... The, County councils have been actually denatured and, uh, you know, they're just reduced to nothing compared to the co competencies that they used to have. This is a key diagram showing where, you know, we've got 56,600 hectares of silvery pasture, that's trees with livestock. We've got different opportunity zones, linear corridors. If we just planted additional trees along the hedgerows or the roads, that would be another 10 million trees in Hampshire. Nature recovery zones, different one, different idea of production and re recovery. So to recover meadows and things like that. So this is the highest scale. The money that could be brought into this, building on the model of Todd Morden, really, starting small, pension funds. I used to be a, a senior executive within the Fountain Forestry Group. I ran one of their companies. We used to regularly get pension funds to support tree-based projects, forestry. Unless we had a proposal for a mil 100 million, we weren't allowed in the door. So when you talk to a pension fund, you go for a 100 million pound project. Current level in the UK, three trillion pounds. A lot of that is invested in fossil fuels. Why the hell don't we tap that to have a proper planning and building system, you know, socially meaningful, more kindness, more companionship from the pension fund? Three trillion. Uh, sorry, what's the one wrong there? Uh, state agency land assets. The biggest landowner in the UK is the Forestry Commission. Heck of a lot of their land has no trees on it. The military has an incredible land asset. The church... All these are wasted spaces. It's massive amounts of land available. Three billion of state agency land agent assets. This is where we need the architects. What the hell can we do with that to help people in the widest sense with more kindness, more companionship? Impact and carbon funds is at least a billion pounds available. So this is the scale to think of and the new opportunity for climate change resilience. Not the silly policies of the government. The government's totally dysfunctional. It's reduced to a level of laughable corruption in the UK. 
The system of governance has to be changed. So sustenance examples now. So, you know, where's the proof of the pudding? How many people can we support? So, if we want to support people in their food requirements, well, how are we going to feed these people? How are we going to feed poor people from our own land resources? Well, we can feed 30 people per hectare from wheat. So forget animals, that, you know, we, we won't feed, you know, you'd be less than one person. Actually, but 30 people maximum from bread. Bread is not a good thing. The carbon footprint of a loaf is over a kilo of CO2, most of that from the wheat and the oxides of nitrogen. So we need to be very careful when we look at climate change what the key issues are. Bread, not a particularly good idea. Forest garden plot, only 0.6, so a lot of these notions are romantic. What I'm talking about is proven exemplars based on science. This is not a set of romantic notions at all. So the system that we've optimised in Holland and various places is potato and walnut growing together. The potato really likes the shade of the walnut, Walnuts providing high energy oil, incredible oil, incredibly nutritious. We can, we can support 86 people per hectare in their food requirements for the year. This is their caloric requirements. Nobody talks about this. Farmers talk about yield. We're not on about yield of particular commodities or the commodity world. We're on about feeding people, which is essential for climate change resilience. Um, so, you know, um, so even this 86 people per hectare is only 47% of quantum efficiency. So we can do a lot better than this by cropping the vertical dimension. We need far less land in the UK if we did agroforestry. We would spare so much land for nature and happiness. So this is a different kind of vertical farming. This is not resource intensive crazy mechanical systems this is letting the plants do the work how can we let the plants do the work how can we form companionship between the plants and ourselves the plants and the animals financial targets now so we all we all live in a, a society money you know we despite our wishes we've got to get some money from somewhere so for cricket bat willow agroforestry that we do in Milton Keynes, £70,000 uh, per hectare we get from that after, year, after 12 years. So not too long. People think trees take ages before they make an effect. They don't. You plant a tree and it'll have an effect on the animal or on the plant within the first couple of years. You don't need to wait a long time. £70,000 a hectare from the trees alone. So Milton Keynes can be very proud of what it's doing with that. Payback year is 12. Um, so um, nuts, nut-based agroforestry, um, uh, also £70,000 a year. We produce very high-value products from walnut, uh, hazel, chestnut. So we have oils and we have carbohydrates. We can make milks, a whole range of products. Nuts are very important, along with special fruits such as quince, which is incredibly water resilient and important for flood management or flood mitigation. Um, and uh, mulberry is an important one as well. We now look at the village level based on Ebenezer Howard's work where um, what we want, so we're talking about, this, I did a spreadsheet model based on a thousand acres of land bought at agricultural prices and we work with architects to build on 30 acres. So 30 acres on a thousand um, and it's a rental model. And the money from the rents goes into a community commonwealth fund. So this model gives an annual income of £11.5 million per village per year forever. 
So absolutely mind-blown. When you take Ebenezer Howard's numbers and, use, you, and put them in today's figures, the income to the Community Commonwealth Fund in that village is £11.5 a year from the rental yield of the housing stock, businesses in the urban area and also the agricultural yield. And he came up with a radical concept that we don't have today which is called agriculture-supported community. Absolutely mind-blowing concept. We're not even scratching the surface today. We don't have agriculture-supported community. We don't even know what it means. He did. Species then, oak. We want oak, but not so... You're all too young to probably remember Star Trek. <laughs> because... The planet I visited, I turned round and I say, look, they're trees, Jim, but not as we know it. You know, Spock said that it's life, Jim, but not as we know it. When they're on, uh, Where I've been with my team, they're trees, Jim, but not as we know them. So they're not any old trees. These are wonderful trees. Oak, what do we want that for? Well, we want the acorn flower. Absolutely incredible food. So easy. So we substitute wheat in bread. We make acorn bread. Great fun. Um, but we need trees with better precocity. That means we need them to give their acorns after two or three years, not 20 years. Mulberry, incredible. Black mulberry is an incredible tree. Uh, has incredible effects on the soil and the plants that grow next to it. Uh, very high value products. Quince, I've already outlined that. That's incredible fruit and it's very water tolerant. So we work with jam factories to line the irrigation canals with quince as bioengineering and we get all this fruit. Hawthorne, not the Hawthorne you know. Hawthorne is the most important soft drink in China called sadsa. So we want crataegus but with bigger berries. Hazel, incredible, incredibly lucrative. We're, we're selling hazelnut oil to China. Unbelievable, the export mod markets. Cricket bat willows. Cricket bats is just going up like a rocket as wi women get involved in cricket, so the US does. The government's actually done something useful to negotiate the trade tariff with India, so we're exporting more cricket bats there. Stone pine, the most valuable nuts that you buy in the delicate we can grow in this country and we can get incredible yields. Uh, almond and sweet chestnuts. We want fruits or nuts within three years. We need to optimise the spatial and temple arrangement. We need shade trials to select understory crops and animals that like the shade. And definitely it's a no-spray future. We don't want to get involved in that rubbish. So you can use Aliaceae to reduce disease and let the trees and plants and animals work together to reduce the diseases and pests. So trees, what well, the recent science is showing trees to be amazing things. So the willow, for instance, gives out methyl salicylate, these volatile organic compounds, which tell the animals that disease is on the way, and you need to eat my leaves to have a tonic to prepare yourself for the disease. Similarly, the plants... There's a disease on the way. They're communicating with each other, not just through mycorrhizal contact, but through volatile organic compounds. The trees are also giving out dimethyl um, sulfate, which is actually telling the sky, you know, I like Jimi Hendrix, kiss the sky. The trees are kissing the sky, telling it, please bring the rain. DMS is a, mo is a molecule given out by the trees that forms a nucleus for raindrops. So absolutely incredible when you, when you go on the journey of discovering the, the sort of companionship and partnership in nature. It's quite incredible at what scale this operates at. Products, so these hazelnut milk, uh, nut flowers, new systems coming on board in Kent agroforestry vineyards, Tree enhanced rewilding, silver aqu aquatic systems. One of the most important things we're working on in Bangladesh is floating gardens. So we take an invasive plant, water hyacinth, 
strap the stuff together, it floats, then you plant on top of the water hyacinth. Procurement. We need to look at trying to remove the supermarket dominance and the, and the crazy value chain system in England and have direct procurement so we can feed hospitals, prisons, hospitals, uh, schools. So the recommendations then, we need to look at how to develop standards, like you've done the passive house salad uh, standard, please now look at houses as homes, and for a home, you know, so I, I want a new house to look for my grandchildren, I'm, I'm going to be a typical client for an architect. My grandkids want to come and play in the garden, they want, and it'd be great if we could all feed ourselves. Um, so we need a standard for a, fo for a little forest garden or a, a food forest as part of climate change resilient schemes, you know, at the single building scale, just a little a group of houses or at a, a new village or new town scale. Um, that should be a central part of environmental building. You know, I think people might be too warm in your passive houses. We're going to need a lot of shade everywhere. You know, it, this year in Kent, you know, I, I changed the direction of my route, you know, going to town. Where are the shade trees? I need the shade trees. They're going to be very, very important. Where are you going to put the shade trees in, in your designs? How can you mitigate the energy aspects of your building by what you're planting on the roof? or what you're planting adjacent to the building. So trees are, and plants are very important in the architecture of the future. We need to form new partnerships. So Mary's given an incredible example, really, of a partnership between um, the people and the police. We need, you know, we're all working it together to try and face climate change pressures. New partners, uh, that are cognizant in the value chain. So we, when we buy stuff from the supermarket, how do the poor people benefit from that purchase directly? Who benefits? The farmer doesn't benefit. Most of them are going out of business. As I left Kent, uh, because of ridiculous industrial processes, we lost £5 million from the gala apple production because of lack of pollinators. So we've got colossal catastrophe facing us in relation to food and the crazy supermarket model. So we need to have partnerships where we're, you know, producing stuff locally and selling to um, people. And we all have a share in the whole value chain. It's not just producer and consumer. We're actually part of the same social enterprise. Uh, different models of governance linked to impact funds, Optimise land use with restoration at the core and looking at re-looking at rental yield and Edwardian economic, um, not Edwardian, um, Howardian economics. So to revisit the three magnets, how can we bring the beauties of the country, the strong aspects of the town together in a new vision for new forest villages? So my vision is new forest villages. What does that mean in the context of climate change resilience? Uh, if you want some more information, then there's a textbook called Temperate Agroforestry Systems that gives all these ideas. Um, there's a paper there on forest gardens. I produce a paper which is available to you in the town and country planning association that puts out all the, all the financial details and the governance details of forest villages in the Town and Country Planning Association journal. So I'd like you to think of trees and plants and companionship from the level of one of Mary's planters outside the police station to a whole county and see how we can face climate change together. Thank you. Any questions?